Black Panther Wakanda Forever has finally dropped in theaters, so it's time to talk all the spoilers. Hi, my name is Sean, and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comments section. Share your thoughts on Black Panther Wakanda Forever, and feel free to spoil away down below in the comments section. No need to put a spoiler warning, and if you haven't watched the movie yet, Go watch the movie, then come watch the video. You have been warned by the title, by me right now. This is a spoiler review. Also with that in mind, I've got chapter markers down below. So if you wanna skip ahead to a specific topic in regards to the film, a specific plot point, you can just skip ahead down below, down there. With that said, let's get started with some audience reactions. I've actually seen the movie three times and at all three screenings, I tried to get some audience reactions and here's what people had to say. So we just got out of Black Panther Wakanda Forever. What'd you think about the film? Honestly, great movie. It was a very powerful movie. I thought it was a great movie. It, it was an awesome movie. I loved it. I enjoyed it a lot. It was, it was awesome. It was great. Man, it was great. It was very emotional. I honestly would recommend it just on the emotional experience alone. I really liked it. I think the movie was super powerful. It held a lot of like emotion in it. It hit every emotion possible mm -hmm. that you could think of. Every sadness, grief, happiness, joy, denial. Yo feel so much loss but it's great sometimes was kind of nervous going into it phase four hasn't been the greatest so far but this was a, this was a breath of fresh air the acting was amazing of course angela bassett kills, killed it yeah i think honestly you know i wouldn't be surprised if she get nominated for supporting actress mm -hmm. standout performances honestly from angela bassett as well as uh who played namor uh, they were both amazing, just commanded the screen. Namor was amazing. Uh, he was the character I was most excited for because I love him in the comics. It focused more on the Namor stuff, but I really liked that. A great character, a great villain. I loved seeing Namor on screen and Ironheart. It felt like it all wove together, these characters. The action scenes with Namor were one of my favorite parts mm -hmm. about the movie. Right. Beyond that, I mean, Namor is awesome, Shuri is awesome. Beautiful visuals as well. See this in IMAX if you can. This is. This is a step up from Marvel for MPK score for sure. The mid credit scene was beautiful. I think him having a son was probably like the perfect ending. The only thing is, I'm not for sure if this will be a, as a, a rewatchable movie. Like, I don't want to like going to a funeral until I watch this movie. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, really so <laughs> we, we watch a couple times, it's going to be hard. Make sure you pee before. It's a long movie, pee before. Maybe a little bit too long. It was three hours long. Uh, there was little bits where I felt like they weren't really as important with Ross. I feel like it didn't really, it, they just did that for world building. I think they ended the movie perfectly. So overall, it's an amazing movie. I absolutely want to see it again whenever I can. It, it was a great way to close out phase four. Now keep in mind, these are opening night crowds and people that went to promo screening. So they are diehard fans. So they probably have a little bit of bias towards enjoying the films. Likewise, they're pretty much all fans of my channel that recognized me, that approached me and wanted to share their thoughts on the film. So once again, a little bit more bias towards the positive. From there, let's start talking about my general impressions about the film. And as I've mentioned already, I've seen the movie three times in the last five days. That wasn't actually intentional. I got invited to the wrong promo screening. So when I RSVP'd to that promo screening, then they went, oops, the press screening is actually a couple days before that. So then I had RSVP'd for the press screening. But one of the fun things about getting invited to those early showings is you get to bring a guest. And so what one of the, my favorite things in real life about doing what I do is getting to take people to movies early because I do it every week. But for most people, that's like really cool and special. So it's just really fun to get to take them. So I ended up going to two early screenings kind of for that purpose, because I knew it would be really special for the people that I was taking. And then I had purchased tickets for opening night because I just love to see Marvel movies with the opening night crowd and normally do kind of fan meetups at them, which I, I did at this one and got to talk to a bunch of people. So that's why I saw it three times. And my review is done after only watching it the first time. And I would say, having seen it two more times, I stand by what I said in my initial review. Uh, I probably have a better grasp on why certain things worked for me and why other things were maybe maybe cluttered in the middle, but kind of stand in the same place that I landed, which is a movie that does a great job of just bringing out big emotions. And it, it just kind of takes the real life tragedy that happened behind the scenes 
and, and it uses that to drive so much of the emotion of the film where and everyone is just bringing that to their performances the pain the tragedy all of it is right there on the screen and in so many different ways it's a powerful powerful film and as best i can tell they had this idea for the story outline script ready to go before chadwick boseman died in which case they adjusted it in light of the situation but kind of still have the same plot in place and you can kind of imagine how this story would have worked with t'challa as the lead character but because his character ended up being you know dying in the opening sequence of the film it adds so much extra emotion and weight to what's going on where the people that are running wakanda are still in mourning and each of them is responding differently because of it. And they're trying to hold the country together. And there's so many layers to what's going on that wouldn't have been there before. And just, I just feel like it acts like it, it. It's weird to say, but it kind of benefited the film in a certain sense. There was a big loss, but they did as best of a job as they could in the situation to tell the best story possible that brought out the biggest emotions and which honored Chadwick Boseman's legacy. Now, I also said in my, my review that it, it does kind of get muddled in the middle, and I'd say it goes long in the middle. Having seen it a couple times, it feels like this is what the director's cut should have been, where the one that you normally release in the theaters is, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes shorter when you have movies that are kind of this big. And so if this movie had been like two hours and 20 minutes, it would have kind of moved like at a, at, a, at a nicer pace. And it felt like this is the one that kind of had all the moments, the fullest version of the scenes, every little bit that he wanted in there is in there. So it just feels a bit too long, especially in the middle where there's all this kind of stuff going on. It's just a bit too long. And the, the better version probably would have been 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes shorter. And afterwards I was talking with someone in the hallway about this. And um, it's not that there was like a, plot point that I think you could just cut out to do that because it's actually a very tightly written script where you think about some of these scenes where uh, Shuri is talking with Namor and each kind of detail kind of matters like at the beginning they're just kind of casually talking about a bracelet that he, that he gives to her well, that's really important because it ties into the plot later on and the whole movie kind of there's little details in each line of dialogue that pays off later on so it's tightly written so you can't just cut scenes out without messing things up but I think every scene could probably be a little bit tighter and shorter. There's just a lot of these beats where it's just kind of all of everything that he wants is in there. And if you tighten everything up, it just probably has a nicer pace to it. But it, it delivers a story that I thought was a appropriate follow up to the first film as it's a movie about a nation. And now it's a nation in mourning and dealing with the ramifications of the choices of the first film. That makes sense as a follow up. And then as a movie paying tribute to track Bozeman, I think it, it does that. He's not in the film, but his presence is felt throughout it. And I think he's greatly honored by it. So that's kind of my general impressions from there. I'm going to just kind of walk through most of the story and kind of give my thoughts, feelings on the, the way things played out. Every time I do these, I think I'm going to be nice and short and I go really long. So who knows how long this thing's going to be. So the movie kicks off with the death of T'Challa from a disease. And we see Shuri desperately trying to save him. So much so that people are advising her to drop what she's doing. This is not gonna work. Just go be with your brother as he's passing. And one of the key things that's built into this is that she's trying to reproduce the herb that gives the Black Panther his strength that Killmonger burned all of it. And that's where there's some of these things where it just it, it, it that like they found plot points in the previous film to even kind of enter to tie into this in a way that like feels like that makes a lot of sense. The, OK, I, that that's that's clever. And it almost feels like it's tough to even talk about in certain ways because it's like almost tasteless to say that you're uh, using a plot point to explain a real life death. But if you're trying to honor someone's legacy and move forward, I don't know what. Chadwick Boseman 
his wishes were, his family's wishes were, but uh, kind of have to go with the fact that they knew him in real life and would want them to move forward and honor his and his work by continuing the story forward. But they, like, they found a plot point to even tie that into to why the character would would die in the continuity and create this extra arc in the film of trying to continue the Black Panther mantle by trying to resolve this issue. And I thought that was just like a a really smart way to do things. But the other thing that the sequence does is it establishes in the opening line to dialogue where, where Shuri's at, which is she's, she's turned into a very much a skeptic that she doesn't really believe in what her people believe in. And afterlife, God, all of these things, she's very much in a dark place in that regard. And it very early on establishes that and all throughout the film, there's this cynicism from her and she, you, you understand that she doesn't naturally have T'Challa's nobility. She's a good person. She's on the good side. She's not driven by wrong motives. Like I guess vengeance gets in there, but she also just doesn't have his innate noble nobility. And that's very clearly stated in the movie. And it gives her like a, 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 a kind of a much more compelling arc in a certain sense than even T'Challa got in Black Panther because he's already such a well-rounded, good person at the start of his film, whereas she's in a dark place doubting so many different things. And so it creates a full journey for her to be on because of this. And then just in general with the sequence, as you're watching it, it's you can't really separate the character from the real life tragedy. And so the sequence itself plays very different with an, with in the film than most sequences play in films because it's designed entirely as a tribute to a real life passing. And it, it creates very interesting emotions as you're watching it because it's such a different sort of thing to see in a film. You don't normally watch a movie and you're actually mourning the the death of someone that you didn't know while mourning a character that you enjoyed. Um, I don't even have words to describe it, but it certainly evokes big emotions. And then it goes into the Marvel um, logo and it's, it's silent. And it's just, once again, a tribute to Chadwick Boseman and only showing images of him. In the three screenings I was at, it, it was just dead silent. All of them. Just there was not anyone making a noise. You just could feel everyone in that that moment. From there, it kicks pretty straight into the plot of the world wanting vibranium. So at the very end of the first Black Panther, actually in the first the mid credit sequence, T'Challa goes out and he goes to uh, United Nations or whatever and basically tells them we have vibranium and we're more advanced than all of you. So he basically tells the world finally what they have, and that will have ramifications, but we haven't seen those ramifications yet. And in the world of the MCU, a long time has passed. It's been four years in in our time, but even more time has passed because of the blip taking place in MCU world. So a bunch of nations are not happy that they're not sharing vibranium the way that they these other nations believed that Wakanda should be doing so. So it makes it real quickly starts its intercutting between these hearings with people breaking into a lab, trying to get vibranium and you establishes right from the get go that Wakanda's is vulnerable, that people want what they have and they're taking aggressive action against them to get it. And people know Wakanda does not have Black Panther anymore to protect them. Just establishing that. And you you feel that this nation that is the most powerful, advanced nation on the earth is suddenly feeling threatened for the first time. And they're feeling threatened because they offered to help people. Like, we want to help the world. We want to try and advance things. And because of that generosity, that's why they're in danger. There's something interesting and compelling about that. And, um... All throughout this, I mean, Angela Bassett gives 
quite the performance. And um, people talk about, oh, it's just comic book movies, just blockbuster performances. And, it, you know, it's just, you know, simple stuff. <laughs> the performance she gives in every scene in this movie is just just incredible what she does. So whether she's like talking down to these leaders of other nations or giving speeches later on in the film, it is a is a intense, intense uh, performance that she gives. But the way it plays out is that the um, Koye's crew captures the um, uh, mercenaries that broke into the lab and dr brings them into the hearing to make this big spectacle of like, we know you guys are trying to break in. This is what happens. You better knock it off. But just right out of the gate, establishing vibranium is a resource that people are willing to go to action to obtain. Then Namor and uh, his crew start getting involved in everything. So the question is, are they allies or enemies? And what's kind of going on here? So there's this sequence all about uh, showing how... CIA and different forces have found vibranium in the ocean using some piece of technology and then Namor and his people wipe them all out. And it's just a little sequence that kind of sets things in motion. So the previous scene establishes the tone of where things are at. And then something happens that looks like the Wakandans are becoming violent about against anyone trying to get vibranium. And then we get a scene where uh, the Queen and Shuri are coping and mother to her daughter is trying to help her daughter respond better to things. And once again, Shuri's in this dark place and it's just rejecting the customs, rejecting everything. And the mother's trying to help her daughter cope properly. Her daughter is disappearing into technology and doesn't believe in the black Panther. And she's just hurting. And she's like, interesting, just like, to view different people's responses to tragedy, to loss. And all of that is emotion that's in the film and themes and weightiness that's added because of what happened in real life. It, it wouldn't have been there otherwise. And that's where it just feels like certain that as tragic as it is, it, it did something to elevate the movie in another sense. But... They have the scene where it kind of establishes Shuri's very angry and even references burning down the whole world. That's how angry she is. Then Namor shows up. And one of the fun things about Namor is the, the way he's written is that he can very quickly cut between being intimidating and being affable. Like he'll be very fun and smiley and jokey. And as soon as it gets to business, he locks in and is threatening. And he's very comfortable being in this this middle ground. ground. He's very comfortable, or having no middle ground. He's very comfortable being like, there's no middle ground. I want Wakanda to go get the scientist that built the vibranium detector, and I want you, we're going to kill her. You can do that, and we'll be best friends, or you, you can not do that, and we'll go to war. And he's written to be like, that's, he's, his two extremes and everything. So conversation, he will be joking with you and then he will threaten to kill you and your whole family. And then he can go right back to joking with you. This is one of the interesting things about the, the, the way that he's written, characterized and performed that it's just these extremes very quickly, but right out of the gate makes it clear. You need to go get this scientist person or else we're going to war. And the previous scene establishes these people of the sea, they're not messing around. Like, they are powerful. They've got weird siren abilities that can make people walk into the water. Namor himself can take out a helicopter just like that. No problem. So you do not want to mess with this guy. So then Okoye and Shuri go on a mission to get the scientist, and it is Ironheart. It is this girl. They meet up with Ross to ask him what he knows, and he, he he tells them, like, the U.S. government thinks that you did that thing in the Atlantic. They're like, what thing in the Atlantic? And as much as they trust each other, neither side can really say everything that's kind of going on here. And he's much more helpful to them because it's on a personal level, he feels like he has to. And he thinks that they're, they're good people. He trusts kind of them more than he trusts his own government with information in a sense. So he gives them information, finds out it's this girl. They go to meet up with the girl. And we're introduced to, to Ironheart. 
uh, this 19 year old girl who is a whiz at building things. And um, I, I thought in many ways, I liked the way that she was used. And in other senses, I'd agree with like what my wife said, that it was awkward the way that she's introduced. She's like really important, you know, 30, 40 minutes into the movie. And then she's very active in the last 30 minutes. And then there's this hour or there's 90 minutes right there in the middle where it's just, she's just kind of there along for the ride and they don't quite know what to do with her. So she just kind of cuts to her randomly like, oh yeah, she's still here and, and makes a little quip. She's very much a plot device character in this film where there's a piece of tech that sets things in motion. There's a piece of tech that makes it so that all of these people of the land can find vibranium. Namor doesn't like that. So we need to stop the person that invented this tech so it can't be made again. So plot device, it drives the plot forward. And then they, they chose someone that they're making a series out of. So it ties on the grander MCU and all that fun stuff that they like to do with these. But uh, I, I thought that was a pretty clever way to do it of if you're going to do Ironheart, if you're going to have this 19 year old brilliant person that can build a Tony Stark suit Sure, that's also the person that can build this tech, that can detect vibranium. I'm fine with that. And, uh, you know, she doesn't dominate the film. I think wish she could have had a little bit more to do in the middle, but she doesn't dominate the film. She shouldn't be distracting from everything else. She should be a nice little, you know, spice on top of everything. That's what she was. She had a little bit of levity here and there, had some funny jokes. It made you be like, oh, she's fun. I'd, be, I'd, I'd enjoy seeing a little bit more of her on screen. And as someone that's never read an Ironheart comic, I was like, okay, now, now you've given me a flavor for what her series will be when it comes out. Cool. I, all right. I, I dig that more now. So it kind of served its purpose. But so they, they go to her lab and... Um, the feds show up, in which case they need to escape. And Ironheart jumps into her makeshift suit that she spilt over several years. And I know one of the fears that I had and some other people had kind of going into this is do they make her just, just too smart where it's just ridiculous that she's able to do what she's able to do? And I don't know what point in time someone's too smart when so many of the characters that we have established are brilliant people that can do impossible things. And Tony Stark walks into his kitchen and he goes, ah, time travel, I got it figured out. And he's in a cave and he can build the first Iron Man suit in secret and fly it, use it without having test run it or anything like that. You know, it's always kind of been built in that there's people super smart. And I mean, they, I think they did enough to be like, maybe she built the vibranium thing in a couple months, but she... To build an Iron Man suit, it took her a couple years. So they, they did a little bit to give some amount of believability to it of a sense while being something that's obviously totally unbelievable. But so is the idea of someone building an Iron Man suit in any context that does the ones that these movies do. So, I don't, you know, was she too smart? I, it, it felt like it made enough sense. And when she gets the fancy one that's fully developed, it's with Wakandan technology and Shuri's lab and all of that fun stuff. But so feds show up, they're on the run. So we get our little action sequence, get some fun moments in there. And eventually Namor's people show up. And this was a pretty cool little action sequence because you have Okoye who well-established as an incredible fighter and the way it's designed, she takes on three of these people of the sea and pretty easily defeats them. So she kills the generic soldier people, so she thinks, and then she fights the big gigantic warrior guy and he's pretty easily dominating her. Like he has the same fighting skills as her has, or similar fighting skills, but he's dramatically stronger and then while they're doing this, the other three people stand up. The people she killed aren't dead. And you immediately just feel the sense of danger because she was good enough to defeat them and still didn't defeat them. And there's something about it where you go, oh. And there's even little moments in the fight that just feel brutal as every time he hits her, she's flying backwards and having to use the spear to stop herself. And then he's just toying around. Like he, he knocks the weapon out of her hand and kicks it back to her because he's having fun. Like, okay, you you beat my my three helpers. How can you do against me? Ah, you're not so tough. You're not so good at this. And he's just messing around. There's one shot where he like throws her, slams her into the pole and she just falls over. Great shot. You just feel all of it. And she hits it. Like you, all three times I saw the movie, people went, whoa, as soon as that moment happened. And then Namora is like, hey, 
Let's stop messing around. We got to get out of here. You had your fun. Let's end this. And uh, so then Shuri runs over to Ironheart's body. He's like, no, 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 don't kill her. I, I demand you let me see Namor. So he takes the two of them. Akoya got knocked into the water by these water bombs. And we move into the, the middle section of the film. And this is where I think the movie, at, at right after this moment, things kind of get really bogged down until um, the attack on Wakanda. And it's it's not like overtly bad. There's a lot of interesting things in here, but it just, you can feel it slow. This is where I think they need to find a way to like take this and tighten it up quite a bit because uh, it, it, it just loses a lot of energy when there's all this stuff kind of going on in this part right here. But big one, Koya has to go back and you just get this tremendous scene where Koya is like, all right, send me. I'm going to go find her. I'm going to bring your daughter back. Going to be the hero. I lost. They were really powerful. I defeated them, but then they got back up. And the queen's like, you're stripped of your rank. All three screenings I saw, the room goes, oh, like more so than characters dying in the movie, her being stripped of her rank in that moment. Because we we spent a lot of time with Okoye across these movies. I mean, she had Endgame and Infinity War and, of course, Black Panther. And she's just loyal to Wakanda. Puts her life on the line, stripped of her rank. And, you're, and what's it, that Angela Bassett just giving, like, there are lines in this when she delivers it of just the emotion where she's just chewing everyone out, calling out the, the events of Black Panther where like, kill you guys let Killmonger take the throne and I had to run over to the Jabari tribe for protection. You didn't protect me. He did. I told you not to take my daughter and now she's gone and like she says it like, like oh, she's not, she's being extreme here but she is not wrong. Everything she's saying makes sense. Like, okay, yeah, Okoye really has messed up. And there is a reason that the queen is not okay with her. And you just, whew, I mean, I, maybe probably some of the, the most passionate line delivery in the entire MCU is in that scene right there. Um, and that's where this movie is just, we talk about a movie that's powerful, packed with emotion. It seems like this one. Someone losing their job and you're like, oh, oh, wow, that just happened. So then we move kind of into this this middle section of the film and you have quite several different things going on. Obviously, Shuri has been taken captive and she's taken to Namor's land. And then you have the queen going to Nokia to recruit her to go on this rescue mission to try and find where Namor is at. And so it's just kind of like a few too many things going on that kind of stretches it out. And you kind of feel like probably needed to find a way to introduce Nokia earlier in the film and find some other way so for her to get to Namor faster so that we didn't need to have so many moving parts during this section where you just kind of loses a certain amount of momentum around here because we've got Shuri with Namor and he's giving exposition, telling backstory while someone else is hearing stories about him and going to different places while we're cutting to Ross, who's talking about things. There's just a lot of talky talky elements right here uh, at a point in time where you, you really kind of probably need to have it be a little bit tighter. But big one in here is we get Namor's backstory and they, you know, they tie it into um, European history and the conquest of the Americas. And so, you know, it ties into certain the you know the worldview that you know Ryan Coogler's you know ideas he's exploring about uh, colonialism and its influences on the world and things like that so ties that into the the thing that motivates the villain which of uh, Killmonger's was a very different version but there's a similarity in the energy of what motivates them to act in each situation but um you can understand where, because of sickness, there was a tribe that was going to die. And so then they find the herb powered by the vibranium. And I guess my, it's the same herb from Wakanda it was my understanding. Um, I, I don't think they would have a different word for it, but um, that was my understanding, correct? I, 
I interpreted that right. Um, that's why she was able to synthesize it using the bracelet later on in the film. But so then they all take it, but it mutates them. So it's different. So I didn't, I didn't quite understand exactly the rules of it when you're having magic herbs that give people powers and mute, like introducing words like mutant. It, it's all mumbo jumbo. So I, I don't know that you need to find perfect logic for how the way expert works, but all the regular people take it. They lose the ability to breathe normal air. They have to breathe water through gills, but his mother, it makes it so that he's uh, like Blade, a creature of both worlds, all the strengths of both, none of the weaknesses of either. And you get him and he refers to himself as a mutant now that the MCU is starting to bring that word into things and preparing us for the X-Men, but Namor, a mutant. And then they, when his mother dies, he returns to the surface and sees slaves and the way people are being treated, what they're okay with. And he's just disgusted by the land, um, the surface dwellers, slaughters them. And even his name is Namor, no amor, no love. And uh, he has no love for the surface world. And that's why his enemies call him that. And because his enemies are the people of the surface. Okay, ties together. There's a lot of moving parts in there. So it feels like a pretty long exposition dump when they do this. And it's followed immediately by... Hey, let me, let me show you our capital, which is then a sequence that's kind of gorgeous, especially if you saw it in IMAX. It's a cool sequence in IMAX, but it's talky scene followed by like, hey, look around scene. So it's just a, a lot of things in here that kind of um, feel different. You get a great little laugh in here, though, in the transition, where she goes, I'd love to see your city. And he goes, if I took you with what you're wearing, you would immediately go into hypothermia and then your blood would become toxic and the weight of the water would crush you or I can just give you a suit and it's a the, the line works because he's consistently written to have that like intensity followed by like smile guy or smile guy and immediately transitions to I will kill you if you're not my ally so the joke works because it's consistent with the way that he's been where he is throughout the entire movie so it's a great little laugh but Long exposition scene followed by long, hey, look around scene. If there's a way to tighten all of this, I think this is where the, this is the spot right here where my negatives really come into play of like, tighten this thing up. And kind of running along with this, you have um, our spy trying to find them. And so then spy and the queen come up with the plan. Queen summons him and, uh, she will sneak in to grab Shuri. And you have Shuri is trying very hard to find a peaceful solution. She's like, I respect what you're doing. I don't want your world to be messed up. What can we do? I'm not going to kill a 19-year-old girl just because she's smart. I'm not going to do that. But I respect that you want to protect this and don't want people digging up your world. You're not wrong that they will do that. What do we need to do to find this this middle ground and maybe they would have found it, but then the queen summons him as a distraction to save her. And that's where like, when you have moments that tension that feels earned, like as the audience, we, we know information, all the information, the characters don't. And so we're going, Oh, this is going to go bad. Like Shuri might be on the verge of finding the way for her to get to go home. The queen just wants to save her daughter. Queen doesn't know Namor isn't threatening her. He just she just knows her daughter is gone. Uh oh, this is uh this could go really bad. So then our spy shows up and kills two people in the process. One of them in particular seemed kind of afraid. She didn't seem like she wanted to be in action mode, but she's holding a knife up to our our princess. So she ends up getting killed. And Shuri's like, I need to save her. Like if she dies. We're going to war. Like, we need to stop her from dying. And like, we got to get out of here. She's going to die anyway. There's no way to save her. We got to get out of here. And as the audience, you feel that. Like, you know what Shuri knows. Like, that's not good. We, She can't die. And, but there's no way to save her. So they get out of there. And Namor finds this person dead and is very unhappy about it. And that's where you start to feel earned conflict where just the right set of circumstances happen. People don't know information. They do something that makes sense is justified in the moment, 
But if they had other information, if they could behave differently and people are just vulnerable enough, just their own little flaws that lead to this moment that tips all the dominoes over to lead to all out war. Real quick, I want to talk about Agent Ross and director Dave Fontaine. So Agent Ross is well established in our world of Black Panther, where I believe he was introduced in Civil War and then becomes a major player in Black Panther. He's saved by Shuri and the Wakandans and therefore owes a debt to them. And he's seen like, they're the good guys. They have this incredible technology, credible resources, and they're not using it to do any, any harm to anyone else. Okay, they're better than us. They have a better moral compass than us. We would be doing bad things. And so he's trying to help the Wakandans while knowing or not knowing exactly what's going on. And then director Dave Fontaine, we finally get to spend a lot of time with her. So Elaine from Seinfeld, she was introduced in the post credit scene of Black Widow. I believe that was her first appearance. I'm trying to remember what was the first appearance? Was the first appearance? No, the first appearance was it... Um, was it Falcon and the Winter Soldier? <laughs> like, she, she, oh yeah, that's right, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. So she's introduced and like, oh, okay, who is this person? And you can tell she's like cynical government person that loves power and is recruiting people for something that's probably not good. She shows up again in Black Widow recruiting someone once again for whatever she's up to is not good. And so we know not to trust her. And then you have this guy that we do trust. And when she's introduced, it's very quickly established. They used to be married, which is just a fun, interesting detail that makes you like, why did he marry someone like her? I don't know if it makes a lot of sense in the way, the light of way that he's been characterized, but it adds an extra interesting dynamic to them. And so we finally get to spend some time with her and trying to piece together exactly what her goal is in all of this. Because she doesn't seem like she wants to go to war with Wakanda, but it's not clear exactly what she does want other than power and vibranium. So she sets this whole thing in motion where she puts a wire on the beads that Ross picks up from the crash site so that she can hear everything that he's doing, knowing that he's going to tip off the Wakandans, which is exactly what he does. And so it just... Interesting dynamic between the two of them. In in light of the movie, every time it kind of cut to them, you kind of want to just go back to the main plot. This is another part of it where there's just a few too many moving parts right here so that we're in the middle where it gets bogged down a little bit. And we keep cutting to government meetings about the government's thinking about going to war. Gov U.S. wants to attack Wakanda. They they can't keep you know kidnapping people and attacking CIA stations. Ross, like, they're not doing that. And so it's it makes sense in the plot, but there's just so many pieces. A lot of reviews are calling the movie overstuffed, and I, I think that's a fair criticism. I wouldn't, I don't know, I wouldn't, that didn't hurt the experience too much for me, but I think it's a valid point. There's, there's a lot in here. And if you had all these plot points you were looking to do in the Chadwick Boseman version of this film, and then you have to, adjust the film to add all of these layers about mourning and loss and Shuri's kind of journey of uh, being in a dark place to accepting the mantle. You have to add all these new plot points in, in which case you just start to stack up a little bit. There's just too much in there, in which case whenever we're cutting to CIA agents kind of talking about stuff, loses some energy. And we get to a point in time where it's fully revealed that she's been bugging him. And so she arrests him and the, the dynamic between them. She's always fun. Like, you don't need to call me director, really. When she arrests him, you can call me director because he had a treasonous phone call. And so it's tough to like, what, where, where exactly is she going in all of this other than definitely wanting power and vibranium and knowing you don't trust her? She, her motives here, whatever they are, are not good. So back to Wakanda and Namor is not happy. So he attacks Wakanda. And this is a, a very cool sequence because you actually get to, it feels massive as you're looking at the capital of Wakanda and it's being attacked by water spraying out everywhere. These soldiers are popping up. Namor is able to take out all these ships. So it just 
feels like this huge, gigantic battle for Wakanda, and you feel the danger of all of this. And um, there's all these little moments that keep reinforcing how, how dangerous Namor really is. And so there's a moment where M'Baku gets up behind him and swings at him, and Namor just blocks it and then punches him in the chest, knocks him backward. And like, as this scene is happening, my wife turns to me and goes, he's not going to die, is he? He's not going to die. She's like, oh no, oh no. And so as soon as he starts, he goes, whoo, starts breathing. She's like, oh good, oh good. I, did, I didn't want him to die. I was like, well, don't, don't get too comfortable. It's, it's going to go bad. And so, um, but you just have this gigantic sequence. So much so that I think it, it makes the actual third act feel a little bit too small scale because you do have a sequence that feels like a massive city whole cultures in danger and then final battle on a carrier so it makes it feel small by comparison to this big action sequence but the the really important thing that kind of goes down in here is that the queen and ironheart are in the throne room namor told her before if you try and find my city i will come here and i will kill you and that's essentially his whole goal in all of this is that he disrupts everything. So all the forces, guards are out trying to save people. So the queen is exposed. And as soon as she is, is killed, they back off. And they, they've come up with a great way to do it that, um, that they, they're, you have to find a way to make it so that why is Ironheart sticking around? Why is she getting involved? Why is she invested in the story? So once again, she's a, she's a passerby and everything taking place, but you see the queen be maternal and protective of this girl that she just met. And a girl that in a certain sense started all of this chaos, but the queen is still protective of her. And doesn't try and turn a 60-year-old woman into a superhero, but makes her into something so much better, which is just a noble person that despite her position, despite everything, chooses to do the right thing and protect her. So when the water bombs go off, they're way underwater, she could swim up and save herself very easily, and she decides instead to grab uh, Ironheart, catch her, swim her up to the top, and in the process, ends up drowning and have the people come in trying to save them. And have the sequence where Namor, who once again go, go from fun guy to just cruel, just like that. And he's staring at the princess, who's now the queen, knowing that he's killed her mother. Like, you got one week. You could make a decision. Are you my ally or are you my enemy? I'm coming back and I'm going to kill all of you. And we're going to go to war or you can team up with me. And we need to control the vibranium. We need we are, we can do this together because I am not going to sacrifice my culture. So, and he just, they were having a good time the day before. He's showing her all the sights, sitting there peaceful. And then the next day, he's killed her mother but he's also being like, we can be allies. We can be allies. Choose to side with me or choose to side with them. It's about to go down. So then we go into the preparation montage. And actually, I love preparation montages like this where they try to get the tech together and research the thing and um, coming up with the plan and everything. And there's several layers to this one. So they come up with a plan of like, how do you weaken Namor? And then... You're like, all right, Ironheart, you got the brains to build a suit. We got the technology for you to be able to execute it. Go make one of those. And then they take the bracelet to, like, create the herb so that we can get a new um, uh, new Black Panther. And all kind of running parallel to this, the culture's kind of gone on to the Jabari tribe and the mountains to try and be safe. And they're trying to decide who will be the new ruler, like, can we really, is the princess, is she going to take over? Should we have someone else do it? What, what do we think that we should do with all of this? It's all kind of running all at the same time. And then the, the big thing that happens is she synthesizes the new herb. She decides, Shuri takes it. And so the question is, who is she going to see in, in the afterlife? And um, turns the corner on the throne in her little vision in the ancestral plane is Killmonger. And on, you're trying to think like, who, who do you put there that has the most emotional weight? 
And if you take a character like her, who is so fun and kind of like, like a comic relief character, almost in the, the first film where she's making sneaker puns and things like that. And then you put her in this movie where she's in a much darker place. Uh, that she's kind of lost her, her faith even in these ancestral planes. It, she just it, she said at the beginning of the movie, before her mother died, I want to burn the world down. If I stop and think about it, I want to burn the world down. And then her mother dies because of that guy she's about to go to war with. They find a way to earn bringing back a dead character. And there's a, there's a built-in plot device to where this would happen. He, he was... A, he's a relative of hers who is also was the king of Wakanda for a brief window of time. Like it, it fits in the mythology and it fits with the place that they've put her character in the story, which is a very dark, dark place. And so while she's like surprised to see him as it kind of, you walk through it, the anger that she has, it, it makes sense. And he continues to be this character that is like so in the wrong and at the same time, having a pretty good read on other people in another sense. Oh, I'm getting a phone call right now. It is spam. No need to worry about it. But I got to put my image back up there. Hey, look at that. If you're wondering how I put the images up there, it's it's just using my phone. And so at the moment, it's kind of that. We'll be right back. But so she's talking with him and he's not wrong on a bunch of things that he's saying that like your dad was a hypocrite. He would have killed that girl. He killed his brother, my dad. Like, stop and think about that. He's like, and your brother, he was too noble. He did something to, he did something to like try and help the world. And because of it, people are trying to invade Wakanda. His heart was, I want to help people. We have the resources to help people. And there's consequences that come with that. He was too noble. It's like, all right, who, who are you going to be? Are you noble like Chitala? Or are you going to get business done like me? And then she wakes up out of it. And you're wondering, like, is she going to tell who she saw what was going on? <laughs> she does not. And had this moment where she's like in denial. Did it work? And then pretty clear, she punches a suit, flies backward. Like, pretty clearly, she's she's got power. And then they're like, oh, we're going to need to get a suit for you. She walks over to the suits and she grabs the, the gold helmet. <laughs> The Killmonger helmet. And you're like, oh, she's she's not in a good place. She really is taking inspiration from the villain of the last movie that um, they, they he, he's trying to like she calls him out on some stuff in the vision where she's like, you know, you burned down the herb because you were insecure. He's like, ah, that's not what it was like. He burned the herb that could have saved your brother. And. That's true, and there's all sorts of ways in which he did do things that led to this moment. And he's like, no, no, that's not on me. Um, but, like, she grabs his helmet, and her suit takes inspiration from him. So then you get the sequence where she finally reveals herself as the new Black Panther in, the, in Jabari throne room. Everyone's debating who takes over, and then she just drops down in the middle of it. And I... The, the theaters I was in, you could feel the energy in the room. There was definitely claps at the last night in the theater when when the theme kicked in of her in the suit and people realizing the Black Panther is back. And then uh, you, you have your M'Baku, who is a foot taller and weighs more than double what uh, uh, right weighs and kind of does the good old fashioned predator power shake. And she's able to move his arm. And you go, oh, Oh, it's going down and you can, you know, the energy just changes in the room as they realize we have our protector again. And they have kind of one final like little scene where they're deciding what they're going to do. And M'Baku is, is trying to like be the voice of reason throughout the whole movie. He's kind of been the mentor to her of trying to like, like what's the right thing to do in this situation. It seems to have a better moral compass than most of the other people there. And he's like, we shouldn't go to war. Like, don't kill him. 
That's not what your mom wants. That's not what's good for anybody. She's like, this guy deserves to die. It doesn't really matter what my mother wanted once or wanted because she's dead because of him. So he's going to die. And that'll bring us to our final battle. And uh, I, I mean, I would certainly say that I think that this is a better third act than the third act in the first Black Panther. Some of that simply because the third act of the first Black Panther is the weakest aspect of that movie where it just... Um, there's just some odd choices where they have two dudes in black suits in a space with a black backdrop as CGI fighting. And it's just like there's no contrast between what they look like in the backdrop. So it just looks funky. It looks very CGI. It's cartoonish. It's a none of it. None of it was as good as it should have been. It was the, very much the weakest aspect of the film. And it, it didn't. Certainly there's some moments between T'Challa and Killmonger that have some some weight to them. But the whole kind of third act of this one is kind of the fulfillment of Shuri's character arc of the, being in a dark place and having to decide, are you consumed by the wrath or are you going to choose to be noble like your brother? And, um, and, and just in general, I think there's just more stuff that I found interesting and exciting to see. But so we get kind of this big, gigantic fight on the carrier where Ironheart shows up. And so we get a new Iron Man suit and some fun stuff that comes along with that. Uh, I don't, I'm not crazy about the design of Ironheart's suit, but I don't really care that much about the design and the, the grander scheme of things. So it's just it's kind of fun to see, but kind of like, OK, cool. We got a we got a new Iron Man-esque character in the world now and she has a fun personality you get um okoye and the midnight's angels and kind of just taking some of these characters that were great warriors and giving them this you know giving them an upgrade with their own advanced suits you know i if you have characters that you've already established are some of the best fighters in the mcu continuity i don't know know that those are the characters that are most interesting to put in advanced suits in the context. It made sense because we need the advanced suits to fight the superhuman creatures from the water. So it made sense in the context to, to do that. Uh, but on a, like you think who's they're, they're cool in and of themselves. They're cool because of their skills and giving them a, a cool suit almost diminishes the coolness of the fact that they, you know, Okoye, Okoye defeated three of these people on her own with just her spear, but they're superhumans. They came back. So, you know, put her in a robot suit to be able to defeat them even more. So it's not quite as interesting to me as if you give that to someone else, or if you find a way that doesn't require to have an enhanced suit to defeat an enemy, it just, it's more kind of compelling in the context with the nature of the character, but it's fun to see characters get an upgrade. And then of course you have the situation where they capture Namor and have the fight with him on the shore where I, I think, I think they wisely made sure to dramatically weaken him before the fight starts. If you make him show him as powerful as they've repeatedly shown him and have a new black Panther that you haven't fully convinced me that she's super duper as trained as T'Challa was for this role. Uh, they've shown her in the action, in action in the other film. So I, I believe she's a person of action, but that's not the same thing as being a master fighter to be able to beat a super villain that's super powered. So you have the character that you do something where they dramatically weakened him, put him in a crash, put him in a desert and he's in desperation. The wounded animal can deliver a number of blows but she's also a vicious wounded animal herself. And so they, you know, very early on have her like cut the wing off of his foot, which once again, all three times I saw the movie, you hear the audience go, Ooh, as soon as she cut that wing off of his foot, you just felt it in the room. It's fascinating how certain injuries get a reaction out of the audience. And the bad guy here having his wings snapped and you felt the room go, oh, and then they show her holding it. And it almost like, for whatever reason, her holding it in her hand adds that extra layer of like, it's just, oh my goodness, that just happened, didn't it? They keep fighting and each of them are delivering enough blows and eventually he's able to like impale her. And I don't know, the way they did this, it's, you know, you can be impaled in 
kind of depends on what it hits as to how bad this is. They've established she's got the herb in her, so she's super powered, so super healing. The previous movie established Ross gets shot. You just put one of these little beads in there and you'll be okay soon enough. She's got a suit that's probably got that built into it. There's there's reasons to, to be able to overcome the idea of her being impaled. Uh, but she gets impaled, and so she's not in good health, not in the best of shape. If you're going to impale someone, if you're, that's the injury you're going to choose, you probably need to pause it, do something to make it not like, when it's right here, it just feels like, okay, there, there's a lot right there that could be injured that you can't just shrug that off. You can't just technology that. You can't just, she took the herb that. Probably should have picked a different location for the impalement um, for it to feel a little bit more like, okay, yeah, she could continue from that. But as soon as she gets impaled, Namor is pretty clearly, he's not well himself and needs water. She dried him out before, oh, we got another phone call coming in. Another spam phone call. If you're wondering what my days are like, it's nonstop spam. So let's just... Here we go. We'll go with this picture, me and my kids in front of the Wakanda Forever poster last night. But um, he um, clearly is dried out. He's not in good shape. And so he's desperately trying to get to water. And she kind of, you see her kind of break the spears, pulls off of it and pulls in front of him. And she doesn't beat him in a fight at this point in time. Like he's ready to go. And she just goes, puts the button on her belt to set the engines off on her jet deal, Wakanda forever, and torches the guy. And this is another one where the audience went, whoo, as soon as that happened, because you've just spent all this time, like, drying him out, saw what that did to him, clearly not being in water is messing him up, and then you cook him on top of all of that. <laughs> like, whoa, you just felt the room kind of have that reaction to it when it happened. She grabs the spear and you're not sure what she's going to do because, you know, she's angry. And so it kind of finishes the scene with Killmonger and you kind of see all of the, um, she was like, I want to kill this guy. And she see the process going through her mind. And finally she sees her mother in the ancestral plane. He's like, show her who you really are. You're not that person. You're angry. But that's not who you are. That's your the emotional state you're currently in. And so she convinces him, like, we'll protect your oceans. We'll stop people from finding the vibranium. We're not going to war and we're not killing this girl. And he he agrees to it, in which case they, they fly back over in, in a ship that I guess there was a ship somewhere. Um, and we have peace. That'll bring us to the epilogue of the film. And several different kind of plot lines. We they just have to resolve right here. So um, they send Ironheart back, and they kind of fix up her car. Another kind of example of because she there's not there's not really a whole lot to do with her. Like she's just kind of along for the ride. Once we got past the beginning of the film, and even at the beginning, she's just kind of a plot. Or she's just a plot device throughout all of this. So you just have to do a scene to like find some way to like resolve her so it's like yeah we fixed your car which at this point in time in the movie it's like okay cool i mean i wasn't all that invested in the car but i know she was so cool that we're spending time talking about her car being fixed but okay i guess we're we'll see her again at some point in time and then we got a sequence where it's supposed to be the i guess inauguration or of shuri being announced as the official ruler person. And we saw this in the first Black Panther, actually a couple of different, several different times in that film, and the, the ritual of it. So she's, her ship's lowering down. Instead of her coming out, M'Baku walks out and you know, humor is the uh, subversion of expectations. So you're expecting to see her. He walks out. It's a pretty funny little moment. I'm not quite sure what exactly they're, they're implying here. But she says she can't make it. She had to do something. I am challenging her for the throne. And then it cuts away and it doesn't follow up on that. Like, was he was he joking? Or is is he making a power play? Like, I don't, I'm not sure what exactly was being implied by that. Because if there's a fight between M'Baku and her and she doesn't have the herb, which they take that away. They established that in the previous film. He's going to win. There's no possible way that you can convince me that 110 pound her can defeat 
250 pound him. That's a big dude. That guy is six foot five and just like built like a tank. If T'Challa barely, barely, barely was able to beat her as a muscular dude himself, not a small man, she's going to be in trouble. So I don't, is he actually challenging her? And is that like the whole idea is that he wants to be on the throne? That was a weird thing to like say and then move on. And is the implication that because it has her going off to do other things that she's not worried about the throne, like she doesn't seem like someone that wants to rule. She's a scientist. So she can be the protector. She can be the scientist, but I don't think she wants to sit there and rule. So maybe that's the whole idea of like, he's going to challenge it and she's going to go, okay, cool. I'm fine with that. But it felt like odd. Like, I don't know. Maybe you guys had a better read on what was kind of going on there, but I, I just, it's like, what, what, what just happened in that moment? That seems like him saying, I'm going to challenge her. That means a lot. Then we get a little follow up on Ross. He got arrested and for, you know, treason. You're not supposed to tell foreign nations that the United States is about to go to war with them. So he gets arrested and Okoye shows up and takes him. Not really much to discuss there, but now I guess he's going to be living in Wakanda henceforth. And it kind of you know closes. Oh, and then we got a scene with Namor. I almost forgot about that one where this felt like this should have been like a one of the post credit scenes where the story's resolved, then it teases what's going to happen next, where Namor is like, I wanted to go to war with you. What? How could you kneel to the Wakandans? And he's like, well, think about it this way. Think about it this way. They showed us mercy. They have sympathy towards us. They, they're not, they don't view us as enemies. And everyone's about to come after them. They're in trouble. They're going to need an ally. We went to them asking them to be an ally where things are at, they're going to come to us. We're playing the long game. So he, despite yielding, he hasn't really shifted. He shifted his strategy, his worldview, his attitude. He's still in the same place. He's still a dangerous, dangerous person for us surface dwellers. So it kind of teases that note. And we close out seeing Shuri uh, go, to, go to Haiti and performing the ritual that she wouldn't perform with her mother earlier. And you know, the whole movie is about her dealing with grief and loss. And in her case, refusing to, just pushing it off. And she won't accept her brother is dying. I have to fix him. And then she's mad that she couldn't fix him. And that she's given these gifts and she couldn't find a way in time. And she's resentful of the traditions. She doesn't believe in the ancestral plane. She's in denial. She's angry. She won't perform something with her mother because then she want to burn the world down. And so when you, you get to this scene, you finally have her releasing it. And instead of being angry, instead of being in denial and doubt, her grieving finally in mourning. Uh, and... It makes for a very powerful finale because you have been on this long journey with her and it's a, a movie that is so much about the, the, the passing of the lead character, but also the passing of the lead actor. And so you you have that moment again with her and you feel that. And so so many of the performances in this movie are, are they're given powerful moments and I felt they delivered them, that you just feel the emotion oozing out of this film and so it ends on a, such a satisfying note when that happens. And then we get the mid credit scene, which very much is a follow-up to where things left off. Earlier in the film, when Shuri was with her mother by the campfire, her mother was about to tell her something. She goes, I never told you that I need to tell you something about your brother. Namor shows up, interrupts. So you're like, what, what was that? What was that all about? So we get it in the, the mid credit scene where... Okay, he walks up, and there's a little boy. And the way the shot's done, we're sure he's in focus, right where we left her, and you see someone walk in the background with a little boy. And you, you piece it together. You, oh, oh. And so then he, he walks up, and you have this little sequence where it kind of explains, like, why didn't, what was kind of going on? Like, why why did she stay here? Why didn't she go back? Why wasn't she at the funeral? 
and it's it's because there's this boy that they were trying to keep away from all of that and the time wasn't right as soon as this gets out as soon as people know his life has changed and that's not the context they want him wanted him raised i don't know why they would keep that a secret from his aunt from Shuri. I don't know. That doesn't, that, it's like one of those ones like, you have to keep it a secret from her so that it can be a secret from the audience. I can, okay, I get that. A, like, I understand storytelling techniques. There's a little bit, if you stop and think about it, probably doesn't fully add up. Um, but sometimes in order to have those moments that are so powerful, you, you got to cheat the logic a little bit. And there's a little bit of that right here. And so then he starts talking and this is, this is the cutest little boy on the entire planet. He is just adorable. And she's talking about his name. He goes, your, your name is cool too, I guess. And it's so funny. He's so precious. And he goes, are you good at keeping secrets? He says, yeah, I'm good at keeping secrets. And he goes, that's, that's actually my, my Haitian name. My real name is Prince T'Challa, son of King T'Challa. And you... I mean, just how, what a satisfying, emotional, like the, the perfect place to kind of end this story. And people, well, I, I was surprised, you know, people were surprised there was only one post credit scene. And why didn't they tease what was the next thing was? And that's the note you want to end on. You don't need to like, just like fan service, like here's what's coming next. You don't want to undo just ending on such a precious note of um, when you're telling a story that's all about death and mourning. That's that cycle of life, that there's life and there's death. And when you find a way that you end on that note of he had a son, there's just something about that. He had a child. He's continuing on through that child. That's the note that you want to end on. There's that's there's something really special about that and just such a beautiful moment. And you've got to cheat the logic to make it that that final reveal at the end. What a great way to end the film on a, a note of hope of sorts. And uh, I, I, I just thought that was great. And there's no reason to put a tease after that. That was the way to end it. Anyway, there's my thoughts on the movie. Um, I, I just thought it was very powerful. I thought they did the an amazing job of continuing the first film, honoring Chadwick Boseman. Third act, I would say, is better than the first film. This movie has bigger emotions than the first film. Probably overstuffed. Probably 15, 20 minutes too long. Could have tightened it up. In particular, find a way to shrink that middle section a little bit. Um, you know, it'll, I think time will tell where a film like this fully lands in my ranking of the MCU. It's really difficult with a film like this that has so much emotional oomph to it that you feel a lot watching this movie. And maybe it, it, it clouds one's interpretation of the flaws, that the you'll notice the flaws more when you watch it a year later. Uh, I don't know. I can't in the future. I have seen it three times, though. And all three times, it it carries that weight. It It works on an emotional level. Uh, I think it makes sense as a follow-up to the first film, and they found a way to to, to take the real-life tragedy and wo weave it throughout the entire narrative to do something I, I think was pretty special in a lot of ways. So that's my thoughts on it. Let me know what you thought down below. Um, it's the end of the year for the MCU. It's the end of Phase 4, so I'm going to be updating all of my major MCU rankings. Those are coming out over this next week. They're, by now, there's so many heroes. There's so many villains. There's so many movies, TV shows. These are beast videos to create. So oh, it's going to be a busy week for me. But if you like to talk the MCU, this is the week for you. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV too much. Bye-bye.